All right, beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the So Biz Dope podcast. I'm your host, Pop Buchanan, and I have the privilege and honor to have a special guest on the podcast today. We have the amazing Elaine Alec, who's the author of Calling My Spirit Back. Elaine, how are you doing today? I'm really excited today, (laughs) and I'm really happy to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much, and I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad to see that big, beautiful, bright smile on your face, (laughs) Elaine, because your story is one that's transformational. You know, you went from an extreme amount of trauma and uh, abusive past, and you, you managed to transform that trauma into a healing state. And the Sober is Dope community is all about healing. We're all healing. I'm seven years sober. Um, I erased the darkness of my past and I feel like I've freed myself from it. Um, and the one thing that I keep, the one theme that keeps coming to me when I look at your book and the title is call, calling my spirit back is the empowerment, taking back the power. So one, can you just really... I know a lot of people's first question for you may be, well, tell me about your book. The first thing I want to know is tell me about the title of your book and, and what, what inspired you to call it this? Um, when I first started looking um, at this book, I had a couple of different titles. The first one I was going to call it was Tama's Teachings, which is Tama means my grandmother. Um, and the reason why I am alive today is because of my Tama and her teachings. Uh, this, then I just thought I was going to call it Cultivating Safe Spaces because I wanted to provide a tool for people to learn how to cultivate safe spaces for their healing, for themselves and for others others. And then it was my editor who actually said, you should use a line from your book um, to connect with people. And I think you should look at this paragraph. And it was the paragraph that had calling my spirit back. And there were so many reasons why I chose that title. Um, One was because our people say that the alcohol spirit is a really powerful spirit. And when you drink alcohol, it replaces your spirit and it drives your spirit away from you for four days. And then it takes four days to come back, which is why you feel hungover, why you don't feel good, why you feel disconnected, why you feel depressed. And so it, it takes four days after you drink for your spirit to come back to you. And In the work that I do, my elders always tell me, whenever you give a piece of yourself, you have to make sure that you go to the water and call your spirit back. And so those those things have really kept me going um, throughout my life and always having to ground myself and remind myself that I need to do that for myself in order for me to keep doing the work that I do. Amazing, amazing. I remember I used to have this term called the the, the three-day resurrection. And I always knew that if I really got to a really bad place with drinking, I knew it would take three, which I would, it was fair to say three to four days to feel normal again. And, I, and it was never a minimum of three. It was always a minimum of three. It was never like two days of work. It was always like that third day going into that fourth day, you'll start to have a semblance of re, um, normalcy. So it's amazing that, that we, we, we have that, that resurrection, that calling your spirit back in the three to four days. And alcohol is definitely a nasty spirit. We know that. And that's one of the reasons why I devoted my life to recovery, because I was in such a dark place where that reality hit me. I said, wait a minute, this is supernatural. This is beyond just any, this is like, I'm trapped by something bigger than me. And I need something bigger than this thing to conquer it. And that was the the most high God, the great spirit, as we know, and, and, and I had to reach out to a higher power. So that brings me to you. You're an indigenous author, motivational speaker, spiritual teacher, and self-help for individuals. So I'm really excited to talk about Oh, and also you have a, a your son. He's two point five years old, and he's your promoter. He's a good promoter. I saw him <laughs> that, that this guy's a pro here. He was promoting the book, <laughs> so you see, God is good. So, um, tell me a little bit about um, the your in your background as far as the indigenous side and um, what and, and being an indigenous author. I know that in the summer of two thousand and nineteen. 
you develop the that spirit of responsibility and that 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 courage to say now I'm ready to write this story right from my mm -hmm. from my period I know it took some time so what sparked you in the summer of 2019 to really tell your story from an indigenous perspective of healing um, I was just finishing up my term as the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs Women's Representative, and that is a role that is nominated and elected by the chiefs in British Columbia. And the role that that representative usually took on was um, missing the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls file. And um, during the summer of 2019, I went to 12 areas of the province in British Columbia to talk about Indigenous and women and girls safety. And we talked about some of the really hard things that we didn't really want to address. So we talked about um, the incest in our communities, we talked about the sexual abuse, we talked about the perpetrators that were still living in our communities that everybody knew about, but nobody did anything about. And so we had some really people weren't sure how I was going to be able to hold that space. Um, and so we did it through traditional protocols and ceremony. And we were able to have really hard conversations. And I spoke with over 300 people in a span of six weeks about those really difficult things. And when we were done, people said, how did you do that? How did you host this space? And I started getting invited to go all over Canada to, to host these conversations. And I knew that I couldn't do it on my own. And I knew that I needed to find a way to teach people um, and share with people some of the tools that I utilized. And um, so that's when I decided I had to write the book. And so in December, on December 1st, I told my husband, I need to write this book before 2020. And I said, I'm going to lock myself in this room and just write. And it took me 29 days to write the book wow. that I had put on the shelf for 10 years. And wow. <clears throat> it was, and the biggest challenge wasn't the writing, it was dealing with the, the triggers and the stories and, the, and, and those things and needing to be spiritually and emotionally prepared to put those things onto paper that I knew that was going to be shared with the world. Yes, yes. So it's amazing. So the book it also is it's your it's it's a story, it's a testimony, but it's also a tool book to help people who's in the who's in the trauma get to the other side. So I want to talk about your trauma to your healing. So here you overcame a lot, right? So I have a list here, and I think it's miraculous because most people can't survive this level of thing. Is is hard, right? And I think it takes a certain amount of strength and fortitude. So you have to deal with sexual abuse from the ages of four to 10, right? Um, mom and dad um, had dealt with their, they had their alcoholism. You had your personal bouts with alcoholism. Then there was, I wasn't sure this was applied to you, but this was a theme in the book where it was the incest in the family, the problems with the patriarchy within the system um, and uh, smoking at 10 years old. Then you suffered rheumatoid arthritis at 21. You had, you was a teen mom, or you got pregnant at, at the age of 18. And then you dealt with some abandonment issues with, the, with your husband around 2008. So you, this is all like, you know, the trauma, and then you managed to heal from that and you use tools for healing. Um, are these the same tools that you use for the ceremonies, for the indigenous knowledge to bring people closer and to actually open up the dialogue? Is this, um, are these the same type of tools you use to overcome your own personal trauma? It is. A lot of it was really going back to what my grandmother taught me when I was little. She was a language speaker. She didn't speak English. And she used to tell me stories growing up every night. The, the only time I was ever safe was with my grandma. And she would tell me these stories over and over again. And um, they just taught me these values that kind of kept me going. And they were always in the back of my head whenever it came to a point where I had to make a decision uh, whether I was going to do something that hurt me or do something that was going to maybe get me over a challenge. I always reflected back on those teachings and it was those teachings that kept me alive because there were so many times 
I, I shouldn't be here, right? Yes. So yes. it was definitely those teachings and, and I've utilized those teachings and those tools in all aspects of my life now. And as I've learned from other people who are also spiritual teachers, um, other religions and belief systems, they all stem from the same type of teachings. And um, I really felt like it was important that we shared tools for healing from an indigenous perspective because there aren't many out there. Beautiful, beautiful, yes, yes. So for everyone in the Sober is Dope community, can you give us, um, tell us a little bit about your process of how you overcame your alcoholism and the addiction? Oh, when I started drinking, I was 12. Okay. And um, <clears throat> my mom had sobered up when I was 10. But okay. by then I was done. I was already angry. I had already gone through all of this stuff. And so I really rebelled against her. And she kept wanting to go through this forgiveness process with me. And I was too young to understand it. And it was triggering me. And I didn't want to deal with what she wanted to talk to me about. And so I started drinking. And I became the full-blown alcoholic by 12, 13 years old. And wow. um, my mom would try to pull me back through ceremony or through powwows or through, you know, all of these different things. My mom would bring me to AA roundups and she would take me to church. And there were so many things that she tried to do and I just couldn't get there. And it wasn't, I, and I would stay sober. I would, I would stay dry for maybe a year and then I would start drinking again I could never get past a year and it wasn't until I was 30 years old when I had been sober for a year that I started experiencing anxiety I started having full-blown anxiety attacks and what I later realized was that the anxiety attacks were actually feelings that I didn't know how to process because mm -hmm. Growing up, um, my mom went to residential school. My dad went to residential school where you weren't allowed to cry, where you were beaten for speaking your language, where you were abused by the nuns and the priests. And what? they were, that was, um, that was passed on. It's the, the residential school um, realities in Canada that we're only just starting to talk about, that Canada is just starting to realize that this happened. And so all of these multi-generational traumas were passed on through us and we weren't allowed to cry. We weren't allowed to feel. You're not allowed to talk about that. And it's like when you're, you know, when you grow up in an alcoholic home, you're not allowed to talk about any of that. That's quiet. You, nobody needs to know our business. And so I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know how to feel love. I didn't know how to feel pain. I just numbed it out with everything. And so when I started experiencing this anxiety, I had to figure out how to work through the feelings. And that was when I started to look at my childhood and look at all of those things that I'd stuffed for those 30 years that I didn't want to deal with. And I had to learn how to cry and I had to learn how to be angry, that it was okay to be angry and to, to go through all of these emotions. Um, but it was the, that was, I think, the biggest part for me was really learning to deal with that and be okay with it. And as soon as I figured out how to feel pain and hurt and be okay with that and let my walls down, it was the first time I was able to feel love. And wow, so beautiful. that, and I, I, it was, that's the biggest part of my sobriety and healing is to be able to feel. Yes. Yes, that's very important. So you was dealing with some mental health components due to the mm -hmm. abuse, being able to uh, um, feel like being trapped and not being able to express yourself and being in this system where on one side with the residential schooling is there's abuse there and then there's abuse in, on the indigenous side in the home and then the abuse as a child. So you have to overcome a lot. So I'm definitely think you're an inspiration. If you could do it, many others can do it. And I'm so excited. So as in your book, do you really, so are, is it, right now in the indigenous community current, currently now, are these problems still ongoing as far as the abuse with the residential schools, the abuse within the tribes, and maybe the, um, the, I know there's a big problem with the missing indigenous women. So can we talk about the current environment and how your book is shedding light on that reality? Yeah, there's, you know, we're, we're in a better place than we were 30 years ago. 
So, okay. you know, 30 years ago when I was a kid, um, there was no safe space in our communities and every home, almost every home was filled with drugs and alcohol. And we didn't talk about these things. And over the last, I'd say 10 years, um, we've actually started to have these conversations uh, within our own families, within our own communities, within our own nations and tribes. Um, even at political tables, we've, we've said that if we're going to move forward as a people, if we're going to deal with all of these oppressive systems and colonial systems we need to do the work ourselves and so um the 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 topic of healing has even come to our political tables now and so you know we're able to address some of those things there's still so much trauma in our community um you know we still deal with the same abuse and you know we're dealing with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls there's then we don't even know the numbers, you know, and, you know, we're looking at the systemic racism in Canada and, you know, there's, we've had inquiries, national inquiries that have identified the problems within the RCMP and the systemic bias that there's, that they have, and it's never been addressed. And we have over 3000 recommendations over 20 years on how to deal with it. And Canada has never wanted to address it. And it hasn't been, until um, Black Lives Matter, that wow. Canada has finally decided to say, okay, if we're going to take a look at what anti-racism is, we need to start also addressing what's happening with our Indigenous peoples in Canada. That's absolutely incredible. And, and I hope that, is there anything that w we can do um, anything that I can do, any, anything that the Sober D is Dope podcast can do to bring more awareness to this, because uh, out here, we don't hear anything about that. You know, I'm in New York. You, you don't hear anything. The first time I heard anything about this is when I met my friend Tara LaPlante, who was very passionate. And she showed me when they had the national conference where all of the women and everyone came together and they did, it was a big, a political conference. I don't know if I think it was about two years ago or a year ago in Canada mm -hmm. when they had the panel and they was talking about um, bringing light to the murdered indigenous women. Is there anything that we can do while you have the platform? Because a lot of people listen to the podcast. So let us know. I think the biggest thing is the awareness and the education in Canada. I mean, I know this is happening in the United States as well. In Canada, we always tell people to read the report. There is a report called the uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry Report. Yes, yes that's what I was yeah. talking about. Yeah, and that that's was, was yeah, the big gathering where yes. they, they introduced that report and all of the recommendations because those recommendations actually, you know, touch on some of the systemic issues that are happening within our um, RCMP, within um, our education systems, within uh, Ministry of Children and Families, Child Welfare. So that report lays out a whole bunch of different ways that um, the general Canadian population and organizations can start to shift things within yes. their communities. So, I mean, that's something that I would say in Canada. I know that there's work that's also being done in the United States, um, but there's a lot of people that are trying to talk about MMIWG, but they haven't, um, they haven't, I guess, it hasn't made it so that people are fully aware of the, of the impacts of that. I know that yes. people have reached out to me from the States to ask about that. And um, it's, it really is just that movement, people continually talking about it and, and, and addressing it because you can't change or heal what you don't acknowledge. And if we're not acknowledging that this is happening, then we can't make change. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we have to help it get to critical mass where everyone knows about this and it's a constant conversation. And we can't, same thing with the Black Lives Matter movement. We can't, you know, sometimes things become a little popular and then they fade out. We have to maintain the pressure. Um, we got to keep the, like they said, we got to keep the foot on the neck of the oppressor. So can we talk a little bit, what I want to go into now is I want to get back to the book. And can you give us an idea of some of the tools that you um, outline within the book that pertains to healing? 
Um, I think the number I, one of the things I talk about is there are four necessary conditions to cultivate um, healing. And the very first one that I talk about is understanding self. Mm. And that's, you know, um, I, I like to use my book is rigorously honest. Yeah, and yeah. unless you are able to be rigorously honest with yourself, it's really hard to move forward in your life, especially when you're trying to, there's so much energy that we put into hiding and stuffing things um, that it's hard for us to move forward. And when we're not honest with ourselves, we can identify what triggers we might have and so when things come up in our life wh whether it's a challenge or whether we need to work through something or whether it's rejection um, a lot of times we tend to fall into a self-defeating place where we blame criticize condemn and complain and if we have that self-awareness of what's triggering us and, and why it might be triggering us we can move through it and we can move forward and we can be accountable um, and not dwell on why something isn't working out for us. Beautiful. So that's very foundational in recovery, identifying triggers. But the only way to do that is you have to understand your triggers. You have to understand yourself. Um, in my case, it was losing my father at 14 years old, well, 13 years old. I think I'm still dealing with that because I never quite get the age right. I'm always like, mm. <laughs> but it was between 12 and 14. My dad was my best friend. I think when that was, those emotions were repressed. So I talk about bereavement counseling a lot and trauma there and the mental health aspect of loss and pain and, and how we can use, um, understand that to the hill and also use that as to give us an idea of what our triggers are. So I think that's amazing. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is trauma. In, so trauma in itself. So I noticed that the, the, there's a large theme between trauma and the mental health community. We know that trauma comes from any form of loss or rejection. Maybe you lose a job. Maybe you get, you go into a divorce. Maybe there was some type of familiar issue. Trauma create, changes the brain through neuroplasticity. And that creates these mental health components that fuel our addiction. Right. So can you give us any advice on um, trauma from your perspective and any and the mental health aspects and any advice that may be helpful for someone right now that's going through what you and I were going through with the pain, holding it in um, and not necessarily identifying the triggers, but how to find the courage to get the necessary help, maybe therapy or anything like that? I think one of my saving graces was understanding that understanding what trauma was and understanding what post traumatic stress disorder was and knowing that I wasn't crazy because when I was going through triggers when I was being re traumatized. Um, it affected the way I did everything it affected the way I behaved I started acting like a 15 year old again. Um, those were, that was when I was like in the real hardcore self-preservation mode. Um, I, I was taking part in, you know, I was being riskier with what I was deciding to do um, than I would usually be. Um, I was losing my concentration and I couldn't get out of bed sometime. And I just, I couldn't figure out what was going on with me. And I, I started getting to the point where I thought I was going crazy. And I started thinking about self-harming myself. And that was after seven years of sobriety. And that was after being on my healing journey. Um, and it was because I had been sexually assaulted um, at 36, after doing all of this healing work and after doing all of this stuff, somebody touched me inappropriately and it set off that trauma signal in my brain. And once I learned that that's what it was and that there were people out there, there were trauma therapists out there that specialized in this work that I could talk to and move through with it and, and telling me that the way you're reacting is totally normal and it's going to get better and it's going to be okay. And this is how we can work through it. And there's different ways we can do this. Um, that is what saved my life at that time. And um, you know, just really being able to, to find someone that you can share with. I actually 
ended up sharing what I was experiencing at an AA meeting. And it was after the meeting that somebody came up to me and said, I, I want to share a story with you. And it was that one little outreach of somebody sharing their mental health story with me that, that helped me reach out and look for that help. Oh, wow. That's so beautiful. I'm so sorry that you had to be re-triggered at 36, you know, and, uh, and by telling your story, that's going to help millions of women because the most important thing, and this is me being as humble because I'm not a woman, but I'm, I'm definitely has a lot of empathy there. And I, I'm, I, I understand that we have to get to a place where it's okay to talk about these things. It's okay to not sit on it um, and to definitely really go after the people that um, the, the aggressors as fast as possible and deal with the trauma as fast as possible. So thank you for sharing that because there's a large audience in the Sober's Dope community who has to deal with this type of sexual trauma and abuse. And are you, um, are you currently still going to therapy? Is it something that is part of your regimen? I do. Uh, there's, I'm, I feel like I'm really aggressive <laughs> with, with what I need to do. <laughs> hey, me too. Join the club. Join the club. <laughs> hey. I, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to be ambitious and I'm yeah. going to be doing all of this other stuff that yes. I, I need to be just as aggressive at my, at my healing. And so, yeah. you know, I do ceremony and I have sponsors and I go to meetings and I, I do therapy and I'm constantly doing all of these different things and when when we're you know where I come from my people um, always say when no matter what happens when you're going through your hardest time the first thing they always tell us is go to the water go the to water. the water, water and you either put your your hand in the water or you pray to the water or jump in the water yeah. and so whenever I'm having a really hard time I'll go to the water and jump in and um, I always feel like that helps me that's one of the the simple things that I'll do or if I'm in a hotel room I'll just fill a cup with water and I'll put my fingers in the water and I'll pray to the water to take away what I'm going through Wow, that's beautiful. Reconnecting back with nature. What I do is um, they have this concept called grounding. So I'll go to the park and I will take my shoes off and I will sit, you know, sit in the soil, stand in the soil and I would just breathe and let, you know, I'll channel the energy. Do you practice meditation in any way? Has that ever been a thing? I used to be really, um, uh, I guess, consistent with meditation for a while. Um, and I think once you, I, I need to do, I practice meditation when I facilitate circles. So I do a lot of healing circles and healing work. And I feel whenever I'm holding space like that, it's a meditation because I need to be able to get rid of everything that's in my mind. I need yeah. to be able to stop thinking about, you know, my family or, you know, bad news or, my judgments or figuring out how to respond to something. I have to be 100% present for the person, for the people that are in my circle who are sharing things that they might have never shared before. And so I think that's deeply meditative, um, but I haven't actually practiced meditation in a, in a long time. Okay, beautiful. Well, um, now, one thing I'm really, it keeps hitting me, the ceremonies. Is it, is it okay if you, I don't know if it's private, but can you give us a, bring us in on what the process may be like? It seems so mystical and beautiful. <laughs> and, and I feel like it's somehow some ancestral calling for me because I do believe that I have some native blood in me and I feel like we're all connected. So when I hear your story and I hear indigenous, I like to think, well, maybe I'm indigenous too. And, uh, and, and, I, and I feel called to, to these ceremonies and maybe one day I could visit and we could do one together. Can you give us an idea what, what happens and how that healing takes place? Yeah, I think one of the things I was taught by my teachers is that knowledge is no good if you keep it to yourself. Um, and one of the things, you know, our ceremonies were outlawed and we weren't allowed to gather in groups of more than four people. And so we weren't allowed to do ceremony and a lot of times we had to hide them and we'd do them in the dark. And so I think somehow along the line, along the way, you know, ceremonies are sacred, but I think a lot of the, the multi-generational trauma and teachings that 
came down was that we're not allowed to talk about that. But it was somehow tied to those, you know, this is illegal, we're not allowed to do this. And so I've been taught that there are, you know, it, it's, it's okay to share certain things. And, you know, one of the things is the protocols and discipline. And I do talk about those in my book. There's, you know, protocols and discipline that we have to take when we're, we're participating in ceremony. And that it's all about, you know, how you sit and how you are and how you think. And when I was little, my mom had a medicine person come visit us and I was about 10 years old. And he said, one day, we're going to have medicine people all over the place. They're going to be different ages. They're going to be men. They're going to be women. They're going to be young. But we're going to have lots of medicine people. Yeah. Um, because right now, people don't believe they have that medicine or that they don't have a right to hold that medicine. Mm. He said, but we all have that right. It's in us all to have that medicine. Mm -hmm. And we know deep inside of us what we need to be doing. That's our spirit telling us what we have to do. And so when you like, there's something crosses your mind that, oh, I should do this, or oh, I should, you know, do this gesture or take this plant or say this prayer or whatever that is, that is your medicine. That is your spirit telling you that this is what you're supposed to be doing. And there's a lot of things that have been, you know, taught to us about how to create that space and how to amplify, you know, that space for others to heal and to, you know, do those things. Ceremony doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be, you know, something for show. Like a lot of times you can do ceremony by yourself. Okay. Um, you can do ceremony with a few other people, but it, it is like, it's like that meditation and it, it's like that prayer and it's, you know, it's, it's about whatever your spirit tells you, like whatever that calling is, is, and that helps build that, um, confidence in yourself that you know that this is what you're supposed to be doing and so it's taken me a long time to feel confident in myself to hold these spaces mm -hmm. and to be called a spiritual helper or a spiritual teacher and I, I kind of rejected that title until this year when one of the women who I highly respect in my community um, introduced me to a room full of people as a spiritual leader and that was when I decided to embrace it and accept it and take on some of that responsibility but a lot of it really is just believing and trusting in yourself and having that discipline and all of those things that I hear you know from other beliefs and religions they they're all the same concepts that we utilize in our ceremony and sometimes, you know, all of the tribes and all of the nations, they, they all have different ceremony and they all have different um, ways of doing it. But the foundation of all of them are the same. That's so beautiful. That is so beautiful. And I sense a great spiritual energy from you. You have an amazing light about you. And I'm glad you tapped into that. Sometimes we have to walk, well, that's part of calling back your spirit, right? <laughs> um, accepting your grace and walking within that. And that's, that's one of the responsibilities that recovery has given me, given me back. And I feel giving us back because when I, when I walk in my sobriety, it's like with great power comes great responsibility. You have to go and share this, this amazing truth with other people. You have to, you, you're naturally an example. So you don't have, just by abstaining, I'm able to be an example to my nieces, my nephews and to the world. And it, and it keeps me going. And although I have to do the work every day, that's still part of the healing. And it's okay to walk in your grace. So I love that so much. Now, how's the book? Do, do, so you said the book dropped in July, July 25th? Yeah, the well, book no, really yeah, it, yeah. it will drop. Yeah, yeah. it will um, officially uh, yeah. on July twenty fourth, but yes. people are already pre ordering it on Amazon okay. and Barnes and Noble. Um, Great, and the, the ebook's already available, so okay. people are already downloading it off iBooks and Kobo and all of that. And I was not expecting the response at all. I, I, you know, thought I was going to write this for. a a few people in our communities who wanted to utilize some teachings to help them work within their own communities and nations and tribes. Um, and I didn't expect it to, um, I didn't expect 
expect this amount of people to reach out to me to do to interview me and to ask me about it and to talk about it i've been so overwhelmed my first few uh, igtv lives i i cried through most of them and i still get emotional because i didn't expect it ever to get the attention of so many people when and i when i saw your book it it what because i'm i'm in the process of publishing some work but once in a blue you see a, a work that comes across the table where it's like okay this is important and i had no idea what it was about when i when i met you on instagram i looked at the book i looked at your information i said you know calling my spirit back i said this is it this is it. Whatever it's about, this is it. And it has a special energy. So I'm really excited. This is what great work is about. And this is uh, about healing a whole nation. And from healing that nation, you could help heal the world because we all could identify with your story, how you overcame trauma and all of the different levels of trauma, right? And to see you sitting here now in this brightness and your light and your presence is a confirmation that you're on the right path and that you're truly blessed. So I'm extremely proud of you and I'm excited to now be your friend and to know your story. Um, so keep up the good work. Is it anything, uh, anything else you would like to tell the world about your book, the process and, um, self-publishing versus traditionally publishing. I know you told you, you said that you chose to go to self-publishing route. So we have a lot of bookies on the Sobers Dope podcast. So how was the process of self-publishing for you? I, because I'm an entrepreneur, I, I think self-publishing was naturally the way I was going to end up going because I had more control over my timelines and who I was going to work with and what that was going to look like. And I had more control over everything. Um, and, and it was, and it was risky because, you know, if you're going to pay and invest money into doing all of this work into self-publishing, you don't ever know if you're going to get it back. And yeah, so, yeah. you know, as an yeah. entrepreneur and somebody in business, you're constantly taking risks and you're constantly investing in yourself. And so, because I had that background already, I think I, I, I already was a little bit ahead of, of some people who might not have that background like oh should I do this and is it going to be worth it am I going to make my money back and you know the, all of those self-doubt feelings whereas yes. when you're an entrepreneur you you learn to push through them even though you feel the fear you push through it anyway and with the traditional publisher I, I really wanted to go that route in the beginning to validate that I was a good writer Yes. And, and I wanted somebody to say, yes, this is good. We're going to sign you. We're going to offer you this. We're going to market it. We're going to do all this stuff. And then I really sat there and thought about it. Do I need that validation? You know, okay. I, I dropped out of school in grade nine and I, I don't have a post-secondary education. I don't have any degrees, but I've worked across Canada and I've worked with provincial and federal governments with a grade nine education. Wow. And this, you know, I've been able to make it because of my grandma, because of her yeah. teachings, because of the faith that I've built in myself and the faith that, you know, I've, I lead my life on faith. You know, I, yes. I, I say yes to a lot of things not knowing, you know, and I, I go into a lot of work based on faith. And um, so that was what I did with this book when I decided to self-publish. And, you know, there's varying degrees of what you can invest in self-publishing yes. depending on on what it is and and how professional you want it to be whether you want to include marketing into it or you know whether you want to have like substantive substantive editing done to your book so i went through i said i wanted as near perfect as possible so i took the full editing package and then i uh i took the distribution package so i'm working with them for a year um around my distribution they set it up with ingram spark which sets it up with thirty nine thousand different booksellers okay. um so it's available on amazon across the world um and as a self-published author where they're helping me manage my distribution i get 80 percent of my royalties oh great congratulations yeah so if you do it self so i'm making like five dollars and fifty cents off my book right now um whereas if i were to go with a traditional publisher i'd probably make a dollar fifty oh 
wow yeah out with the old in with the new well yeah. congratulations <laughs> i'm so excited i'm i'm definitely gonna pre-order the book now and i'm gonna put all your links to where everyone could get the book and everything in the show notes just for everyone that's listening any final closing remarks and can you tell everyone um how they can find you on social media and where to find your information Okay, so I, my number one message all the time is you are not alone. You are not alone. Even when you feel you are, there are people that are praying for you and there are people that are loving you. Even if you don't feel it, know that there's somebody out there loving you. Um, I just, I, I, I love you. <laughs> so if you're, you know, if you're, I, I just, I just want to share that with, with people. Um, I think anybody who takes the time to put this love into themselves and to share messages like this and to strive for sobriety, um, I love you for all of those things and for the good that you're doing and for making a difference in the world. Um, so I am on, I have a website uh, www.elainealec.com and that has links to how you can get my book and it'll have more links on the 24th. Um, I am on Instagram, uh, Elaine Alec Writer Speaker. I'm on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Elaine Alec and I'm on Facebook, Elaine McKenzie Alec and just recently started my YouTube channel and uh, I, I've been practicing being on video and <laughs> yeah. you're good you're good you're good <laughs> it's uh it's been a, it's yeah. been a challenge but i'm learning to yeah embrace it, <laughs> embrace it. well you you get a two thumbs up from me you look great the videos are authentic and you got really emotional in a few and i and i and i appreciate how raw um and how real you are and thank you so much for everything you do. We love you too from the Sober's Dope community. I love you and everything that you're doing. Keep up the good work. I'm so proud of you. And we will have you back on the podcast once the book drops so we could go over some more stuff. God bless you, Elaine. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.